Hold it right there, Spider-Man. If you really are Spider-Man. I don't think I need to tell you who Spider-Man is. Marvel's always caring, always heroic, always miserable Peter Parker is one of the most beloved characters in fiction. He's been the face of movies, games, merchandise, and, uh, musicals. Appearing in every age and size to remind us that with great power comes great responsibility. Spidey's success in media is universal, long-lasting, and doesn't show any signs of slowing down. Tom Holland's version of the character is set to take a starring role in the next era of the wildly successful MCU, Spidey's villains are finding new fans in Sony's spin-off movies, and alternate versions of the character, such as Miles Morales, are finding their own foothold in the mainstream through products that focus on their version of the character. Spider-Man is arguably one of the most consistently successful brands of the past century, if not history as a whole. But through it all, the medium Spidey stuck to best has been television. Starting in 1967 with the simply titled Spider-Man, the wall crawler has made himself a staple of the airwaves ever since, with over a dozen shows premiering across a variety of networks and more still set to air in the future. Chances are, if you watched any television growing up, you've seen at least a few of these shows. And whether it was reruns of Spider-Man and his amazing friends next to the 90s series, or spectacular Spider-Man and its controversial Disney successors, there's plenty to see and plenty to remember in Spider-Man's storied television history. But this isn't about the Spider-Man shows you remember. In fact, it's about the one Spider-Man show that seemed to fall through the cracks, the one fans forgot and Marvel doesn't mention. With a troubled production that included issues with Marvel itself, Tobey Maguire, and Pokemon of all things, this is the Spider-Man series that was dead on arrival, buried without grace, and left to rot in a ditch at the cusp of the 21st century. This is Spider-Man Unlimited, and all the ways it was roughed up. Now, some of you may already be thinking to yourselves that the name sounds familiar, even if the show doesn't, and you'd be right. The Spider-Man Unlimited name has been used more than once in Marvel's history, branding the show, a recently shut down endless runner for mobile phones, and the double length quarterly comics of the 1990s. In fact, when production started on the show, Spider-Man Unlimited had far more in common with its comic roots than just its title. At the beginning of 1998, the Christopher Barnes-led Spider-Man animated series had unfortunately reached its end. With the series' final episodes, which focused on the infamous clone saga and retroactively became the first major Spider-Verse event, airing in January of that year. The show's behind-the-scenes troubles could make up its own video, but its cancellation ultimately came down to the very simple reason that it had reached the 65-episode limit. This is an informal rule that means shows are effectively finished when they've created enough episodes to be syndicated by other channels. So despite being massively popular with viewers, and the staff's insistence they already had more plots ready to go, Fox decided to let the Spider-Man animated series expire. While it was never outright said what fueled this decision, rumors pointed to the poor relationship between the network and the show's executive producer, Avi Arad. Arad, who was a chief creative officer with Marvel, as well as founder and CEO of Marvel Studios until 2007, is famously unpleasant to work with. Owning a reputation as a control freak, as well as a tendency to put profit over plot, Arad has come to blows with creators frequently enough that these rumors are worth mentioning in this video as opposed to dismissing them as just rumors. With the show's dismissal, Fox was free of a rod, but this raised potential legal troubles for one of the company's most bankable characters. See, part of Fox's contract with Marvel stated they had to keep an actively running series with Spider-Man's name in the title on their network, which they didn't have now. Failure to do this meant risking the rights to the Spider-Man character, as well as the ability to broadcast his previous shows. So with little in the way of time or money, Fox was facing an uphill battle, but one they really had no choice but to fight. So under tight time constraints and legal obligation, Fox tapped writer Will Mugnot to help develop a follow-up to their cult classic Spider-Man show, more or less just to make sure they could keep rerunning the old one. Mugnot entered as no stranger to Marvel or its cartoons. His resume to this point included writing credits on the beloved X-Men cartoon from the 1990s, the Pride of the X-Men pilot, whose VHS tape I played to death when I was five, the criminally underrated Silver Surfer cartoon, and even the 80s series Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends. 
So right from the start, this seemed like a man who was qualified to not only make a good Spider-Man show, but a faithful one. Now, if you haven't seen any of these old shows, the easiest way to describe them isn't by their varying quality, but by their unifying virtue. Every one of them, no matter how good or bad they were, held a clear respect for the source material and showed a deep desire to do it justice. Instead of bringing the comics to the TV, Munoz's work brought the TV to the comics. He didn't reinvent the wheel, it was more like showing you why the wheel was great to begin with. It made you appreciate things all over again, trying to show you these ever-enduring characters and stories similar to how they were first presented, whether that was vast and cosmic, or straightforward and a little cheesy. All of this is plain to see in the show's end result. Watching Spider-Man Unlimited now, nothing is more obvious than Nino's deep-seated respect for the character's origins, history, and defining stories. Spidey, don't you dare be sick! I'm kidding, of course. God, I could barely do that with a straight face. Anyway, Munoz himself isn't actually the one to blame for this. The writer's plan was never to make a show about Spider-Man in deep space, fighting in a civil war of men and beasts. Instead, Munoz's intention was to actually adapt to the first 26 issues of Stan Lee and Steve Ditko's original Amazing Spider-Man series as completely and faithfully as he could. That's right. The show that's now best remembered as a Batman Beyond ripoff by those that remember it at all, started out as a straight Silver Age adaptation of the Wallcrawler's first adventures. There were no animals, no counter-Earths, no symbiote synoptic, and no capes. Instead, the plan was to take the oldest, plainest, rawest Spider-Man material they had and bring it to life on the small screen. In a now-deleted blog post, Munoz discussed the development of Spider-Man Unlimited and how it strayed so far from its original idea. We started out to do a low-budget but dead-on faithful adaptation of the first two years of the Amazing Spider-Man comic book. For contractual reasons, Marvel and Fox needed there to be a show with Spider-Man in the title to keep the earlier Fox Kids series in play. But no one wanted to pay for the new cartoons, thus the Keep It Cheap mandate. And it made sense. The network didn't need a good show after all, just something Spider-Man to shove between toy commercials for 22 minutes each week. So, with the network's lack of financial support, coupled with the less than enthusiastic reason the show was put into production at all, it seemed like Spider-Man Unlimited was doomed from the word go. Fated to sit next to the oldest Fantastic Four movie, and, uh, the newest Fantastic Four movie, in terms of Marvel projects that were made and seen, even though no one wanted to make it, and no one wanted to see it. Despite the lack of support, however, Munoz and his team would try their best, prepping for their Stan Lee Spidey show with the idea of making it as good as it could be. Now, if this original version of Spider-Man Unlimited were made, it would have likely been a nice, colorful throwback to the classics, something that, at its best, could be great nostalgia for people who read the comics growing up, and great filler noise for kids who didn't. At its worst, it would be a forgettable ashcan copy, but still one that fulfilled the purpose of its existence. Either way, no one really had anything to lose. Things took a turn, however, when production hit what could politely be called a snag. As the team was deep into the planning stage of their show, they were told things would have to undergo a few changes. What kind of changes? Well, the Fox Made show was now in competition with an upcoming film produced by another company. Sony. You might have actually seen what this film ended up being. It was a small movie directed by a small guy named Sam Raimi, starred Kirsten Dunst, Tobey Maguire, Bruce Campbell. Oh, and uh, it would be executive produced by former head of Fox's former hit Spider-Man show, Mr. Avi Arad. The film and its resulting trilogy, which for better or worse was largely influenced by Arad, was a massive financial success, imprinting the character onto the public consciousness and arguably prototyping the superhero film genre as we know it today. The resulting show, however, would face a few setbacks from this. Because of Arad's deal for Arad's film series, his former project's follow-up could no longer adapt primary elements of the Spider-Man canon. Otherwise, it would encroach upon the rights of the newly announced film. 
This meant that his work was ramping up on Mino and his team's 100% faithful adaptation of the original Spider-Man comics, they were suddenly unable to use the original costume, villains, supporting cast, storylines, or even the titles of the source material. With the show's concept now a legal impossibility, Marvel then sent Munoz's team what he called a long shopping list of mismatched elements, detailing approved and requested characters and settings for the show that they still expected to be made. This list included, among other things, Counter-Earth, The Knights of Wondegore, John Jameson, Deathlock, and the symbiote villains Venom and Carnage. Now, this is where we're able to dispel a bit of myth for this show. Of those that still mention Spider-Man Unlimited at all, most call it one of two things, if not both. It's either a poor imitation of Spider-Man 2099, or it's a poorer imitation of Batman Beyond, another network-mandated reboot that featured turn of the millennium style and artificial invisibility to much more success. Here's the kicker though, Munoz has stated both in interviews and his blog that at this point, the team did play with the idea of adapting Miguel O'Hara's Spider-Man 2099, but that only lasted for about a week or so. What stopped them from moving forward with the idea was Batman Beyond itself. The team felt that the Cape Crusader spinoff had covered the future territory well enough, and instead opted to try something different. The resulting product wasn't the future, but futuristic? If you watch the show now, the similarities are there, but they're superficial at best. Batman Beyond has a defined 21st century sleekness, a dark, moody color palette, and the iconic art style of Bruce Timm. Spider-Man Unlimited, on the other hand, features warmer colors, a more conflict-driven, long-term plot, and an art style more similar to Captain Planet than anything in the DCAU. Yes, they both have flying cars, invisibility, big buildings, and animal people, but they were also both futuristic action cartoons made for kids in 1999, and that really doesn't come in a lot of flavors. Even with this weird Marvel potpourri and no defined source material to draw from, Muno outlined the bare bones of what Spider-Man Unlimited would be as best as he could. It's around this time that the law of the series' defining elements began to take shape. Things like Counter-Earth, the Synoptic, and most importantly, the new costume were all developed around this point, and would end up making it to the show's television airing. Munio posted his original treatment for this version's pilot on his old personal blog, and it checks all of the boxes of the show's eventual identity. Venom and Carnage are trying to merge the world with the Universal Symbiote Collective. Not quite the Synoptic, but close enough. And Peter Parker, ends up on another Earth trying to get home to MJ. Outside of that though, things get pretty weird. Like an extreme, over the top, can you believe someone tried to give us this and we didn't get it weird. The story here actually starts with Spidey's big battle against Venom and Carnage, with Spider-Man rescuing Mary Jane from the duo before jumping through a dimensional rift to try and destroy the generator that Venom and Carnage are using to power their symbiote invasion. As Spidey fights back against an army of symbiotes trying to drag him away from the off button, Munio wrote a really cool moment where different versions of our hero could be seen within the portal, showing different outcomes of the confrontation taking place. As Spidey reaches for the button, he sees other versions of himself, some failing to hit the off switch, some losing the fight to the symbiotes, and one even cradling Mary Jane's motionless body. Our Spider-Man succeeds in destroying the generator though, and Free falls through the dimensional rift, witnessing symbiotes and Steve Ditko-esque cosmic visuals before escaping through an exit hole he feels out with his spider sense. This results in him crash landing onto Counter-Earth. Now, starting the first five minutes of the first episode of a Spider-Man cartoon with the tail end of a cosmic battle for the fate of all reality is a bold choice to say the least. It sounds like the kind of stakes kids create when they make their action figures fight, or a JRPG. And what's funny is, it's not even the weirdest thing here. After crash landing on the alternate Earth, where the human bestial conflict of the series proper is replaced by tension between robots and human norms, Peter Parker takes on the role of his alternate self, who has apparently been missing for six months. All of this is told to him via exposition, given by a holographic anime girl secretary named Kai, 
who switches between skimpy outfits to basically serve as the sexy navi to Spider-Man's space link. And no, I'm not making this up. Nino actually uses the words 3D projection of a cutesy anime style girl to describe her in the script. Going beyond this treatment, however, Munio would also describe the long-term direction of the story and setting. The eventual reveal of this version of Spider-Man Unlimited was to be that on Counter-Earth, Uncle Ben hadn't been murdered. And without that life-changing moment, the Counter-Earth Peter went on to becoming a less noble hero and was seduced to the dark side by Venom. Which, to my way of thinking, reinforces the Spider-Man legend rather than diminishing it. To his credit, it was a great premise, given the restrictions. Munio's original idea did its best to encapsulate what made Spider-Man Spider-Man within a show that couldn't actually be Spider-Man. It was something faithful to the spirit of the character, with a message set to emphasize who he was on the inside. With their idea set, the show began production. The art was done, the direction was locked in, scripts were being written, and then Marvel heard what was happening and said no. Yeah, they said hell no. It sounded way too close to the Clone Saga for their taste, and they wanted it burned to the ground. To quickly summarize, The Clone Saga was a Spider-Man conspiracy story in the mid-90s that introduced eventual Scarlet Spiders, Ben Riley, and Kane, and toyed with the idea that the Peter Parker we knew was actually a clone. It dragged on way longer than it should have, ended with massive fan backlash, and after Marvel had just barely survived going bankrupt a few years earlier, left them traumatized and afraid of repeating the same mistake. This is starting to sound like a bad comic book plot. It gets worse. The problem with that logic, though, is that Marvel didn't really understand what that mistake was. Instead of understanding that the Clone Saga's disrespect for established continuity and its excessively dragged out two-year runtime were what soured fans on the story, they instead decided that the issue was having two Peter Parkers. It was this flawless logic that led them to believe the plot of Spider-Man Unlimited had to be nixed, telling Munio, you just have to figure something else out. So, to recap here, Munio was now making a show that started with no money, went on to have no identity, and now had no plot, with production already underway. Despite this, the team did what they could, while still working within the restrictions of Marvel's lists. The societal conflict of robots vs humans was retooled to humans vs bestials. The antagonist was changed from Counter-Earth's Peter to the High Evolutionary and the Knights of Wondagore, and all the holographic anime girls were quietly removed. No! Resulting in 13 episodes of... uh... television. It wasn't great. And no matter how much you could stick up for the costume, the colors, or the fact the show managed to get made at all, there's really no way to defend the final product. The plot was weird, the characters were boring, the supporting cast was completely forgettable, and even Venom and Carnage were just weird aliens that didn't actually have much in common with their canon counterparts. Still, it did get finished, and it did follow all the rules. The fact that it managed that at all is almost a miracle in itself. And considering it was a kid's show made to preserve the rights to another, much more lucrative kid's show, that's really all it needed to do. Eventually, the first season was finished, with a second being worked on as the show was set to premiere. The usual promo machines were put in motion, with Marvel set to launch a monthly comic based on the show, and the Neversoft Spider-Man game, including the Unlimited suit as a selectable costume. The game even went the extra mile by using Reno Romano, the show's voice actor for Spider-Man, to handle the character in the game. Tell me this, Einstein. Who could have wanted to steal Octavius's technology? Oh, oh, we know, we know! Who? The Submariner. The Submariner? Get serious, will you? The Mighty Thor! Are you out of your mind? Don't answer that. <laughs> so... It wasn't exactly what Munio wanted to do, and it didn't turn out exactly as he'd hoped, but Spider-Man Unlimited did manage to get made. Now all they had to do was let the show do what every other Spider-Man show did, sit in a Saturday morning time slot and rack in viewers regardless of quality because it's Spider-Man, and that's what Spider-Man does. After all, it's worked for every show before it, and every show since, so I really don't see what could- Oh. Oh. If you weren't alive or aware in 1999, 
I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible. Nothing beat Pokemon. Nothing. When it hit its stride in America, Pokemon was the most infallible, unstoppable wave of pop culture momentum anyone had ever seen. Cards, games, TV shows, toys, it took over every medium and its appeal was universal. If you were a kid, you were into Pokemon. Your friends were into Pokemon. Your friends' friends were into Pokemon. Your crushes were into Pokemon. Your bullies were into Pokemon. Nothing stopped Pokemon. So, in late 1999, less than a year after the franchise had arrived in the US, and with Pokemon Red and Blue having sunk their claws into every child with a Game Boy, Fox made the unfortunate decision to air Spider-Man Unlimited in the exact same time slot as the Pokemon anime. Now, if you were listening to anything I just said, I probably don't need to beat around the bush to tell you how instantly and horribly Spider-Man Unlimited flopped. Unlimited premiered on October 2nd, 1999, the same day as the Pokemon episode featuring the surfing Pikachu everybody would be talking about on Monday. On October 9th, Spider-Man Unlimited aired its second episode. At the same time, Pokemon was playing Go West Young Meowth, a much-loved and much-remembered episode where we learn how and why Team Rocket's Meowth learned to speak. The next week, Spider-Man Unlimited aired its third episode. By that point, however, it was clear to Fox that no one was switching channels to see the Spider-Man with a cape fight an evil Tony the Tiger, leading them to quietly shelve the rest of the series. <laughs> That's right. Three episodes into its 13-episode run, Spider-Man Unlimited had already been beaten into a full-blown coma. The series would be put on ice for over a year and wouldn't be seen on television again until the airing of its fourth episode on December 23rd, 2000, a full 14 months after episode three was shown. After that, the series was burned off on an almost weekly basis across the first few months of 2001. It received no advertising or merchandise, and with no cheap toys out there, essentially ensured that the show's memory wouldn't even reach as far as the bargain bin fodder of future comic shops. Despite scripts already being written for future episodes, Spider-Man Unlimited was considered a failure and was not renewed for a second season. The show was quickly forgotten by Fox, and after its failure, the character's television rights reverted to Sony. Spidey wouldn't stay off the small screen for long, though. He would next star in 2003's Spider-Man The New Animated Series, voiced by Neil Patrick Harris. Even without the rights to the character, though, Fox would still hold the rights to the Spider-Man Unlimited show and its distinctive Spidey costume. Because of this, the suit would stop showing up in video games after 2001's Spider-Man 2 Enter Electro, and would only make rare appearances across comics and merchandise. To date, there are only two action figures of Spider-Man in this costume, Airstrike Spider-Man from Toy Biz's Spider-Man 2000 line, and Spin and Trap Spider-Man from Series 14 of the Spider-Man Classics line. In the mainline comics, its only featured appearance would be in two issues of Web Spinner's Tales of Spider-Man. A similar, but still different universe would also make a brief cameo in the Spider-Verse series, where its inhabitants are attacked and killed by the vampiric inheritors. Spider-Man Unlimited was never meant to be a great show. Even in its earliest, most hopeful state, it was always envisioned as a time-filling, cost-cutting production that only existed to meet the fine print of a contract. Will Munio entered the series as the only one with a creative stake in the process, and through the show's trials and tribulations, was the only one who never ended up getting his way. Fox met their contract terms and were able to keep their Spider-Man show on the air for at least a few more years. Sony was able to make their Tobey Maguire movies, cementing superhero films in the mainstream and ensuring the character's reputation bounced back quickly. And Marvel is richer than ever and will probably never sniff bankruptcy again. Munio and his show, however, have been relegated to the status of footnotes. Because of Unlimited's poor reception and rights issues with Fox, even the show's costume, my personal favorite for Spidey, has missed so many chances to redeem itself through appearances in video games and stories like Dan Slott's Spider-Verse, places which serve as the easiest spots for non-mainstream versions of Spider-Man to find themselves a few new fans. It is still interesting to think about what the show could have been in its various forms, with the evil twin Peter Parker storyline actually sounding pretty good, with a fresh idea, a bold new costume, 
and the ultimate concept that Spider-Man is about the heart of a hero more than the name or powers, Unlimited could have touched on themes that wouldn't be prominently explored until Into the Spider-Verse release nearly 20 years later. Were that the case, this would probably be a show that still had its fans today. While this Spider-Man show still ended up being something radically different in a medium that doesn't hear those words often, it's probably for the best that it failed almost immediately. The best shows are the ones made by loving and invested creators. Spider-Man Unlimited, on the other hand, was a show born of and defined by its executive meddling. Objectively, the show itself probably deserves its obscure status, but I do hope you learned something new today about Spider-Man or just the business of cartoons. I do recommend checking out some of the other shows mentioned in this video though, especially the old Silver Surfer series, to see some highlights of Munio and Marvel's work in the 90s. For now though, this has been the development of Spider-Man Unlimited, and all the ways, it was roughed up.